There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do. Now as we consider that relationship that God had established with man through the law, we realize that that relationship that God had created in the Old Testament had many shortcomings. There was much that the law could not do. Now, had the law been able to bring man into a complete, total fellowship with God, then it would not be necessary that God establish a whole new covenant with man. The reason why Jesus had to come was that the law was not able to do many vital things. And so what the law could not do, what could it not do? The law could not make a man righteous. You cannot become a righteous person by doing righteous deeds. If we could tonight have a open type of discussion. I put a blackboard up here. And I say, all right, now, what should we be doing in order that we might be righteous? And each of you would call out, you know, some special little task that is good and would make a person good. And we would start writing down all of these things. You know, brush your teeth in the morning so you don't offend your wife at breakfast, you know. (laughs) And smile during breakfast. Don't grump. And and we would put down all of these things that would make for a very congenial, nice, sweet, wonderful you. Even if you took the rules that we had established, this is the right way a person ought to live. This is the right way by which we should be relating to each other. And if you fulfill them all, that would still not make you a righteous person. For as we studied a while back, the true righteousness can only proceed or proceed from holiness, the rightness of my heart and character bringing the right conduct. Now, Paul said, if righteousness could come by the law, if we can make some laws and rules that would make a person righteous, if we could be righteous by obeying these laws, these rules, then Christ is dead in vain, or it wasn't necessary that Christ should die. If if God could have devised rules, now if God couldn't devise the rules, how much less can man devise the rules by which a person can become righteous? And in spite of this, it has been the history of the church to try to impose upon people certain rules of conduct which are esteemed to make one righteous. But if we could become righteous by observing these then Christ is dead in vain. So what the law could not do, it could not give you a righteous standing before God. It just can't do that. And yet, it is an amazing thing to me how many times we find ourselves in that mold of trying to, trying to present to God our own efforts and our own works 
as a righteous basis for God's acceptance of us. But God, I don't smoke. You know, surely you ought to accept me and, and, and put me up one rung on the ladder. Because God, I don't do these things. You know, and, and so often we are trying to present ourselves to God in the basis of our works. Our rules of conduct. Because I don't do these things or because I do these certain things, surely, Lord, you ought to give special attention to me because look at what I am doing for you. So that in spite of the fact that righteous, the law cannot make us righteous or rules of conduct cannot make us righteous, we are it seems inveterately trying to present these things to God for his acceptance of us. God just accepts you nasty, mean, and rotten like you are. <laughs> With the flaws in your personality. With those peculiar idiosyncrasies that mark you as a separate person from the rest of us. God happens to just love you like you are. You know, one glorious thing about grandkids is that they just can't do any wrong. <laughs> and God sort of looks on you like a grandkid, you know. You just can't do any wrong. There is so much love pouring forth from God that when our little granddaughter, you know, pulls a little snit and, and says, don't know, we say, oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> you know, that isn't spoiled. That isn't being naughty. That's, that's just being cute. She's just expressing herself. That's just, you know, expressing her personality and all. It's a good thing grandkids aren't raised by grandparents. Our society would be a worse mess than it is. But God's love for us is so overflowing that when we are in a mode of conduct that is even distasteful to us, where we are upset with ourselves, for reacting like that, but I just feel so inside. I just, I don't want to. I know I shouldn't. Oh, but I just can't stand it, you know. And here I am reacting in a way that I know I should and I really don't want to. And I'm angry with myself for feeling this and for saying that. And, and I know, now just keep your mouth shut when you go in there because if you open your mouth, you're just going to, you know, say those things and you really shouldn't say them because later you're going to be sorry. And what do you do? You open your mouth and you say it and then you walk out. Oh, why can't I keep my mouth shut? What is wrong with me, you know? And we go through this whole thing. And, and yet, because we have so oftentimes disqualified ourselves because of the consciousness of our own failure, the glorious thing is that God doesn't disqualify us. There is therefore now no condemnation. Now the law could not give you that kind of a righteous standing before God. No set of rules could ever make you righteous before God. I am accounted righteous before God on the basis of my faith in Jesus Christ. God has imputed my faith or accounted my faith for righteousness. Even as with Abraham, who believed God and God accounted his faith for righteousness. So that is my relationship with God. Not through my conduct, not through my keeping of rules or the law, but by my faith, believing and trusting in God, God accounts that faith for righteousness. When did he start accounting me righteous? Righteous. 
the moment I believed in Jesus Christ. Now, I was far from righteous in my conduct at that time. And surely my conduct since that time has not always been all that it should be. Yet, the moment I put my trust in Jesus Christ and believed in him, God accounted me at that point righteous. And no matter what my conduct was prior to that, God obliterated it. God ignored it. And God just accepted my faith in Jesus Christ for righteousness. Now, I began in the Spirit by believing in Jesus. But again, because we so desire to get into the act, even after a person has begun in the Spirit, we now are going to give you rules by which you can become perfect in your flesh. And so the church so often seeks to impose upon people those rules for perfection in order that you might become the perfect you. But as Paul, in writing to the Galatians, said, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should so soon turn away from the truth? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect in the flesh? No. Having begun in the Spirit, we must continue to walk in the Spirit. Having begun in faith, we must continue in faith. Now, a second thing that the law could not do is that the law could not give to me a desire within to fulfill it. In fact, I must confess that many times the law, rather than creating a desire in me to fulfill it, often reveals a rebellion in me to disobey it. There are some rules that I cannot see any sense for. And whenever someone tries to impose upon me a rule that I cannot see any real sense for it, there is something in my nature that rebels against it, and I want to do just the opposite. When I see these signs, keep off the grass, I have the greatest inclination just to walk on it a couple of steps anyhow, just to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can walk on it if I please. Don't touch. And it just stirs up something within me to want to touch it. Even though I don't care if I touch it or not, but it just says don't touch. And I find that there is, the law doesn't create the desire to fulfill it. It doesn't give me a desire to fulfill it, but often does just the opposite. I find myself many times resenting the law and deliberately rebelling against the laws of which I can see no real justification for that law. And... There are some laws for which there is no justification. You usually find these around colleges and universities where they set certain rules for the university 80 years ago when they were having problems with, um, you know, guys riding their buggies around campus too fast or something, and they make rules that applied to previous generations, but somehow they never get off the books and they become a tradition of the college or whatever. And 
When I was in college, I had more problems with traditions. I'm a very untraditional person. And I found myself constantly at odds with the stupid traditions, dress codes and all, that they were trying to require, which really made no sense. The law does not and cannot create a desire within you to fulfill it. And oftentimes, if I'm forced to obey the law, I find that within me I'm angry. And I'm not obeying it from the heart. I'm only obeying it because I don't want to face the consequences of disobeying it. And while I'm obeying it, I'm, I'm saying, this is stupid, this is crazy, there's no sense of this, you know, no reason for it. And I'm rebelling against it the whole while I'm obeying it because my heart isn't in agreement with it. Another thing the law cannot do is the law could not block out my guilt. Now there were provisions in the law to make a covering for your guilt. But there was no provision in the law to blot out your guilt. For it was impossible that the blood of goats or bulls could actually put away your sin. All they could do was cover the guilt, but it couldn't put away the guilt. The law could show me where I was guilty and then condemn me for being guilty and could cover my guilt, but it could not remove my guilt. The law could not bring me into a fellowship with God, into a oneness with Him. The law, in fact, placed man outside the veil. And man could not approach God under the law. Only one man could approach God, and that was the high priest. And only one day out of the year could he come within the veil into the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God within the Holy of Holies. But no man would dare to intrude into that Holy of Holies unless he were in the office of the high priest and unless it was the Day of Atonement and unless he had gone through the many sacrifices and the many bathings that were necessary before he appeared before God. And finally, the law could give you no power to keep it. So what the law could not do, as we look at the law, we realize there are a lot of weaknesses, there are there's a great imp try another word. Uh, a lot of things the law couldn't do. <laughs> now, it is very hard and frustrating to know what is right and to desire to do what is right, but yet have no power to do what is right. Extremely frustrating. And so the law frustrated man because it showed man what was right. As Micah said, He hath shown you, O man, what is good. 
And as God has declared what is good, and I read what God has declared as good, I say, yes, that is good. I agree with that. And I would like to live that way. I admire those characteristics. I desire those characteristics. I want to live that way. But the law can't give me the power to live that way. And thus it only creates that frustration within because I want to, but I can't. For the weakness of the law is not in the law itself, but the weakness of the law is in me and in my flesh. So what the law could not do, why could not the law do it? Because that it was weak through the flesh. The whole effect of the law is weakened because man's flesh is weak. As Jesus said to Peter, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is is weak. So, what the law could not do, because man's flesh was weak, God in turn did for us by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now we come to Christmas. God coming in a human body. The purpose of God taking on a human body was to help us because we could not be made righteous by the law. We could not keep the law. There was no power in the law to enable a man to keep it. So God did for us what the law could not do for us by sending His only begotten Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, if you would look, look at Jesus, He looked like just the rest of us. He didn't look like E.T. or any weird <laughs> visitor from space. He looked like man. He breathed, he ate, he, he did things that people do. You look at his body, you touch his body, and it, and it had all of the appearance of a man and the feeling and, and everything else of a man. There was one vast difference. With Jesus, there was no sin. So he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. It was a body of flesh, but it wasn't sinful flesh. Now, sin is an additive to the flesh. It isn't natural. It wasn't intended when God created the body. But it was something that permeated, became a part of the flesh when Adam sinned and was passed unto all men. And so God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, but not in sinful flesh itself. Now, what the law could not do, God has done by sending his son. What has he done? The law could not make us righteous, but Jesus has made us righteous and given us a righteous standing before the Father. So that as I am in Christ and I in him come before God, I come not in my own righteousness, not in my own degree of walk or experience, but I stand before God complete in Jesus Christ. As I am standing in Christ, I am complete, completely righteous. 
And that is the way God accepts me and He will not accept me any other way. So the glorious thing tonight is that God accepts you totally, completely righteous as you are in Christ Jesus. And that to me is a glorious thing. It was a glorious revelation to my own heart when I realized that I am accepted by God in Christ. But that's the only acceptance you'll ever have by God. And if you try to come to God in your own works to be accepted by God, you're not going to get to first base. For your righteousness, that is of your own works and making, is as filthy rags in the sight of God. But as you are in Christ, you are always accepted by God. Accepted in the beloved. The law could not give me a desire to obey it often created rebellion. But what the law could not do because my flesh was rebelling against it, God has done for me by sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh who now has come to dwell within my heart and life and by His indwelling presence He has begun to work in me, changing me, changing my desires, changing my attitudes completely and planting now his law right in the fleshly tablets of my heart by changing my desires. And he gives me a desire to obey, a desire to follow, a desire to serve. And it isn't a chore, it isn't a heavy burden, but it's a joy to follow Jesus and to serve the Lord In fact, I know of no greater joy in all of the world than just being what God wants you to be. There's such joy to that. There's such fulfillment to that. Just being what God wants you to be. And so God puts that desire in your heart. He does for you what the law could not do. By creating now a new heart within you. New desires, new purposes. As he writes his law on the fleshly tablets of your heart. Paul tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Now unfortunately many people put a period right there and they quit. And they preach a gospel of works. But to go right on in that same verse, he said, For it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But notice he works first in the will, planting the desire in your heart, giving you that desire, changing your heart, changing your attitude. And as he changes your attitude in your heart, both to will, then to do. He gives you the power to do. The law could not put away my guilt, but God sent His only begotten Son who took my guilt and has put it away completely. In fact, more than that, this beautiful word justification What Jesus has done for you is more than just put away your guilt. He has erased the record and you as are before God as though you had never done it. Now the law could cover. You did it, but it's covered. (laughs) But what Jesus Christ has done is brought you a position before God that as God looks at you, it is though you had never done wrong in your life. You say, oh, but my record. He says, what record? 
There is no record. It's been destroyed. You stand before God in Christ as though you had never been guilty of any offense in your whole life. Justification. What a glorious word for the child of God. Now that past indiscretion that is haunting you, tormenting you, ripping you apart, realize that God has thoroughly obliterated it. In God's book, it didn't happen. It doesn't exist. It's not a part of your record that at some later infraction, they'll bring out and say, well, now let's see, you have a pretty bad record here. I see in 1977, you did this and that, you know, and, and they go through the whole past record and say, well, you've got such a bad record. You know, how can we trust you now to do any better? You know, your record's so bad. Man may go on your past record. God doesn't. Your record's clean. Not a single charge laid against your account in Christ Jesus. You who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What a glorious place to be. The law could not make you one with God. But Jesus Christ has made us one with him. In that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, Jesus said, and ye are in me and I am in you. Jesus has brought us into this glorious fellowship with God, oneness, communion. John, in writing his first epistle, said, That which we have seen and heard we declare unto you, that you might have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. I have become one with God in fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. But perhaps more than any other, the law could not give you the power to obey it, but that's exactly what God is taking care of through Jesus Christ, for it is by his presence dwelling in us that we have that power to be what God wants us to be, to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is what marks Christianity as separate from any religion. Really, as you look at religion, the purpose of religion is to lead man in the right path. As far as man understands the right path. And so you can listen today to many religious systems. And there are some religious systems that have actually a more beautiful way of expressing the ideal than perhaps we do in our crude way For they talk about that beauty of becoming one in the essence of the universe, you know. And, and, and you know, just by the way they, they can express it and say it, it sounds so glorious, you know, as, as you're just sort of purified and, and washed and uh, you come into this beauty and this love begins to just ooze out from you and... And, and all of these beautiful, wonderful things. And, and I have no case against what they are saying many times. In, in that, oh, yes, it is wonderful to love. 
It is glorious to have peace. It is beautiful to be one with nature. But, how can I? When I have this something within me that wants to get even with someone who has done me a dirty deal. I can say, oh, yes. We need to forgive and love all mankind because there's good in all men. Well, there may be, but there's an awful lot of rot in all men, too. And unfortunately, I more often see the rot than I see the good. Buddha said, don't do unto other people what you don't want them to do to you. And that's wisdom. That's a good way to live. That's a good rule. In your relating with other people, The rule for relationship, it's an excellent rule for relationship. Just don't do to them what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Thanks, Buddha. <laughs> you read the writings of Confucius. And he said a lot of marvelous things. How men should live with fellow man. And if we would all follow the, the, the principles of relationships that were set down by Confucius or set down by Buddha or these other religious leaders, it would be a much better world to live in. I will grant that. I have no argument with that. But the fact that they gave us rules for a good life, for good relationships, is not enough. Because the law or the rules themselves cannot make me righteous and the rules themselves don't give me the power to be righteous. And all they do by showing me the right way is frustrate me because I can't do it. I want to, I would like to, but I can't. If someone punches me, I want to punch him back. If someone spits on me, I want to spit on him. I can't stand there and just let someone spit all over me. <laughs> That's just not my nature. So, they may tell me to stand there and take it. And I would say, yes, that would be better. If I wouldn't flail out, then, you know, we wouldn't get in the big Donnybrook. But that's not my nature. To just stand and take it. To stand and be abused. To stand and be run over by people. That's not my nature. And I really don't think I want that to be my nature. For the law has no power to make me desire to obey it. Now, in pointing out the right path, telling you what is good, but without giving you the capacity to fulfill it, it only frustrates. In the folklore, and legends. There are always those interesting stories, legends, about 
a very wealthy king who ruled over a vast dominion, who had a prince, a handsome prince, who was so very sad. He never smiled. He seemed just sad and dejected. And so the king calls in all of his wise men and he, his counselors, and he said, I don't like to see my son sad all the time. I want to see him smile just once. A true, genuine smile. I want him to be happy. What can I do for my son to make him happy? And all of the various counselors give their advice of what, you know, the king should do. And he goes through all of these things, but still the son sits there sad and dejected. You know, it's a typical legendary folklore, and there's hundreds of variations of the story, but the plot is pretty much the same. Finally, one old wise sage, always the last one, everyone, you know, suggests, oh, then the, finally, one old wise sage said to the king, if you want your son to be truly happy, he must wear the shoes of a truly happy man. And so begins the search throughout all the kingdom to find a truly happy man. And finally in a remote village, <laughs> after searching, they find the truly happy man. But alas, he's so poor he doesn't even own a pair of shoes. What are they saying in the folklore? That these things are unattainable. That's basically what they're saying. They're unattainable. Peace, true peace. is found by the man who breathes the air at the top of the Himalayas. But they don't give you any oxygen tanks. They don't give you any ice picks. They don't give you any ropes. They don't give you any survival tents. All they do is point up at that peak and say, if you could just stand on the top of that peak and breathe the air, at that point, it would fill your life with total peace. Thanks a lot, Buddha. You don't help me. You frustrate me because you tell me how I should live. You tell me how I should react, but you don't give me the capacity or the power to do it. So it only leaves me in frustration. God knows I want peace. God knows I want to be happy. But I can't do it. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the power. My flesh is weak. Now, what the law could not do because of the weakness of my flesh, God has done for me by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And Jesus, again, lays out the path. Blessed is the man. And he, and he tells you what it is, those characteristics that comprise the happy man. For the word blessed is the word happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are ye 
who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for you shall be feel, filled. Blessed. And he, and he tells you these things, the characteristics of the truly happy man. But then he says, look, you can never do it yourself because of the weakness of your flesh. So, open the door. Let me come into your life. And my presence dwelling in you will be the dynamic and the power whereby you will be able. For I will do it for you. You can't do it for yourself. But by dwelling in you, I will do it. I will give you the power. I will give you the capacity. I'll do it for you. Just let me control your life. And so we learn to turn the control of our life over to the Spirit of God and we begin then to have a spirit-governed temperament, a spirit-governed life as we've turned the controls over to him. Now, I have discovered that what I could not do because of the weakness of my flesh, the Lord in turn has done for me, and it is the most beautiful thing in my whole Christian experience watching God work in me, doing for me what I can't do for myself. And as I watch myself, I say, that's not me. Oh, that's not me. Wow, that's not me. As I see God working in me and His power transforming me and giving me the power to be and to do what God would have me to be and to do. And because I know my rotten self so well, I get excited when I see God work. I get excited when I see God's power in me doing for me what I can't do myself. And I know I can't do it myself. I tried so long to do it myself and continue to fail. And now to see God do it has to be one of the most exciting Christian experiences that one can have watching God work. And, it, and it's just about like that. You're just about like standing on the sidelines watching God work. And you say, that's not me. That can't be me. Unreal. All right. Go for it, Lord. You know, I just love to see God work in my life. To me, it's just a thing. Thrill and exciting thing. Now, that's what God has done. And that was the purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ. Because here was man trying to climb that icy peak without any help, without any ropes, without any ice picks. And he was dying on the slopes. So the Lord says, hey, no, you can't do it but I'll do it for you. Let me do it for you. Let me dwell within you, and I'll give you the capacity and the power. So that which the law could not do. You see, all of these fellows, Confucius, they gave man laws, good laws, as far as laws go. But laws have their limitations because my flesh is weak. And when you link the law to this flesh, the weak link, snaps every time. I can't keep it. So, God sent His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh in order that He might do for me what I can't do for myself. So, that which the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, judged sin in the flesh. It was judged, condemned, that it should no longer reign or rule in your flesh. It's been judged already at the cross. Taken care of. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, He will testify of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We say, yes, I understand that. No, you don't. Because Jesus explained it. And the way we immediately think of it is not the way he explained it. Of sin, he said, because they don't believe on me. Now, when he said of sin, he's going to judge the world of sin. What were you thinking of? All of those wrong things you had done. You see, that's what you classify as sin. What does God classify as sin? 
the failure to believe in God's provision in Jesus Christ. Of righteousness. Oh yes, doing the right things. Jesus said, of righteousness because I ascend to my Father. Oh, wait a minute. What's he mean by that? The ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven is God's declaration to man, this is the righteousness I will accept. Now, you want God to accept your righteousness? Then what's the standard? You see, if God is going to accept a standard of righteousness, or or going to accept righteousness, he's got to be some standard of righteousness. As righteous as what? To be accepted by God. Will God fudge on it? Will God let down the bar a little bit for me to jump over? And then hold it up when you come? No. To be fair, God would have to have one standard for every man, wouldn't he? He could not deviate from that standard or that wouldn't be fair. Well, God does have one standard for every man. And if you want God to accept your righteousness, all you have to do is be as righteous as Jesus Christ, and God will be glad to accept you. You can ascend right into heaven. God will receive you. God said, well, here's another righteous man. Come on up. And God will receive you. Just be as righteous as Jesus Christ. For his ascension was God's declaration, this is the righteous standard that I will accept into heaven. But he won't let the bar down for you. He holds the bar there at that standard. Well, man, you can run underneath. (laughs) And of judgment. Oh, yes, there's a great right throne. The presence of God. Everything is fleeing away. It's awesome. It's solemn. Judgment. No. Jesus said, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. That's what we have here in Romans. You see, through the cross of Jesus Christ, the power of Satan and the work of Satan was condemned and judged so that Satan cannot hold authority over your life unless you allow him to. He's been judged. Christ defeated Satan on the cross. His works were judged. His power over you was judged. And he can only exercise power over you as you allow him to. If you don't allow him, he cannot. He has no rights in you at all as a child of God. He's been judged. So, what the law could not do, God has done by sending His Son to judge Satan. To put an end to His authority and His power in your life. It's been brought to an end. Thank God. In order that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us. But it is fulfilled in us through Jesus Christ who is dwelling in us. And so that righteousness of the law is now fulfilled in me, not by me. Who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. You see, if I am walking after the flesh, then Satan is still controlling my activities. Paul the Apostle, in writing to the Ephesians, said, And who in times past you all had your manner of living as you were following after the lust of your flesh and of your mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Who in times past, but God, 
who is rich in his mercy, wherein he has loved us, has delivered us, really, from the power of Satan, that we might now walk after the Spirit. And if you are walking after the Spirit, the righteousness of God is fulfilled in you. There is no condemnation because you are in Christ Jesus. What the law could not do in making you righteous before God, giving you access to the Father, giving you this fellowship and oneness with God, now has been done for you and in you by Christ Jesus. What's your place? Walking after the Spirit. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And now Paul introduces the Spirit-dominated life with the flesh-dominated life, which will result in the mind of the flesh or the mind of the Spirit And we'll get into these areas as we progress in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Heard this story one time. This old fellow down in the south who used to get happy in church and had a difficult time controlling his emotions and would just start shouting, Bless God! God, hallelujah, you know, right out in service. Well, the pastor that they had in this little old country church had died, and they hired a new pastor fresh out of seminary, who in his first sermon made a pretty good point that blessed this old fellow, and he just got happy and said, oh, bless God. God, hallelujah, you know. And it's so discombobulated the guy that this, the new pastor that he lost his train of thought. He just fumbled and, and, and had to just close the book and he just lost his composure completely. So the next Sunday as he's preaching again, happened to get another good point that blessed this old fellow and he just, you know, got into it again and, and same result. The fellow just was totally destroyed, wiped out, couldn't finish his sermon. So he called a meeting of the deacons. And he said, fellas, you've called me to pastor this church, and I appreciate the call here, but he said, there's something that I, I just can't deal with. And he said, it's this fellow who gets to shouting right in the service. He said, it just so upsets me that I, I lose my train of thought. I lose everything. I just can't, I can't handle it. You deacons are going to have to deal with that because we just can't have that. It just bothers me too much. So the deacons went out to call on him out of his little farm. and When they arrived, he was out there in his field, had his mule hitched up, and he was plowing. And he saw the deacons coming through the barbed wire, so he called his mule to a halt and waited for them to walk up to him. And they said, well, how's the weather? You know, and he said, oh, you guys aren't here to talk about the weather. You're here to, I know what you're here for. I, I know that um, my shouting upsets the new pastor. He said, and I, I, I could see that the first Sunday, so I thought, well, you know, I just can't do this. It upsets the pastor, and I... I'm just not going to do this anymore. He says, you know, but then I get to thinking how good God is to me. He said, I think of this little farm that God's given to me. Not much, but it's all mine. I think of my beautiful wife over there in the farmhouse. He said, I think of my blessed little kids who are in school. He said, I think of this old mule that I got, faithful old mule that pulls a plow for me. He said, fellas... When I get to thinking about these things, he said, would you just mind holding this old mule so I can get to shouting, you know, and just. <laughs> I get to thinking what God's done for me. I can hardly contain myself. What Jesus Christ has wrought for me by his coming. That which the law could not do, it could not make me righteous. He's made me righteous, given me a righteous standing before God. 
It couldn't give me the power to obey. He's given me the power. Oh, it's so much what we have in Christ Jesus. Praise God. We are blessed, so blessed, to be the children of God. God wants to do for you tonight. The area of defeat is usually the area of the flesh. An area that we have not yet submitted to God. An area that we are holding on to. And that is the thing that is causing defeat. But God has made provision for your victory. You don't have to be defeated Satan has been judged. That authority and power has been condemned. And you can have his victory and his power tonight as you submit and yield to the power of God's Spirit and yield that area of your life to the working of the Spirit. God bless you and bring you into full and rich victory in Christ Jesus.